Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, if you'd like to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and as you do that, I just want to have, I have one quick announcement. Make sure you look at your, your little announcement sheets there of things that are coming up this week and coming up in the future. Um, we're getting ready for VBS, etc. Um, there is one thing that's not on there that I wanted to highlight is that we need some more cookies for um, the, the coffee hour. So if you would like to make some this week and bring them next week or, or drop them off on, like on Friday, that would be great. We would love that. Um, and uh, that way we can continue to be as hospitable as possible for the people who come and join us on Sundays. All right. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me pray one more time for us, and then we'll get into uh, our message. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this, uh, for your word. We love you. We love your word. Uh, we love the fact that it tells us who we are, who you are. It is, uh, it is all that we're, is needed for, for godliness and salvation, and we love that. We want to submit our lives to it, that we might glorify you more, Father, that we might better follow after you, Jesus. So as we come into this moment, Lord, I ask that you would help me to communicate accurately and clearly what you have uh, communicated in your word. That people would hear that we would hear your voice this day, that we would accurately see who you are. Father, I pray that you would make us people who do your word and not just listen to it. For the blessing and 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 benefit of of, of your glory, but also in our own relationships in our lives as we look at this chapter on love, these verse on, verses in love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, first, I want to say I want to humbly submit this sermon to you, in this series, really, because I know many of you actually are far more loving than I am, but I want to be more loving. And this, this, this chapter is going to help us change our hearts to be more loving if we can submit to it. This is our second sermon in this series. We're going to focus on, on just verse 4 today. But I want to remind you a little bit about what we talked about last week. That to approach any of these moral passages like this, where there's commands to be this or do this, um, where anywhere in the Bible, we need to remember something, we need to see something, we need to be something. We need to remember the gospel when we look at these. That the Bible is not about do's and don'ts. Christianity is not about um, a to-do list of how to be good moral people. It's about Jesus and his death for us. It's about restoring a relationship with us, which he has done through the cross. That you are right by faith alone. That when we look at these, these passages, what I want to do is, 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 is alleviate some of our hand-wringing of, oh my gosh, am I okay with Jesus? Am I okay with God? And just, will you please listen to the, his, his word that says, you are forgiven by faith. You are righteous by faith. You have made peace with God. First, Romans 5, 1, we have peace through God by, in God by faith in Jesus. I want, you, I want to relax, relax, stop worrying about if you're right with God and just follow him, believe him. But hold on to the, the, the second half of all who are truly Christians want to please God. I was asked after church last week, are you saying that that means you can do whatever you want if you're a Christian? And listen really carefully to me here. I am, I am saying... Yes, but if you're a Christian, what do you want to do? You want to please him. So yes, the gospel says you can do whatever you want. You're, you are, you're righteous apart from works. But now that that's occurred, what do you want to do? You want to please him, don't you? So we'll show our faith by our works will reveal that we have been saved by faith by the fact that you love one another. Which is our second thing. You need to see in, the, in, in, in these scriptures, these passages like this, your need. You need to see in, the, in, in these passages that this is who God is, that God loves you like this. 
every day of your life. He might discipline you because you're, 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 you're doing something he doesn't like, but he's still acting in love. And you need to see that you don't measure up. You want to please him, and this re- reveals how you don't live up to what you would like to be. You need to see your need, I said last week. And one of my big concerns as we listen to this is that we'll listen to these passages and we'll be going, they really need to hear that, don't they? That person, yeah, yeah, that my wife, wife really has got to hear this. My husband, oh, I need a copy of that sermon for him. And not go, what about me? What about me? Oh, I wish my coworker would listen to this. You know, what about you? My real big concern is that we'll listen to this sermon and we'll go, "Oh yeah, of course I'm a sinner. I, I don't, but I don't, but not be broken by this." You need to be broken over this. You need to weep and wail, as 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 James put it, over your sin. I'm really concerned that 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 we'll just go by and go, oh, well, that's nice. Well, yeah, but there's no no brokenness over your own not living up to what God wants for you. See, remember, and be something. And as we come into this this text here, the last thing as we really get into this, as we start to understand this, is you you need to see it in the context of relationships. You need to see it in the general sense of what Jesus says is to love your na- love your enemies. That that all of these, in particular, love needs to be seen in the in the light of people who are not lovable, who are sinners, who are sinners. God demonstrates His love for us in what that while we were still sinners, He died for us. Romans five eight. Jesus died for you while you are a sinner. See, it's, it's, it's in the context of your people in your lives who are just being jerks to you, who are mean, who are thoughtless, who are ungrateful, who are, are just mean, unlovable. That's the context that love really can shine. That's the context we need to see it that's when you really need to show that you love as God loves. These words all have to be, be, be shown in, the, in, in that light. You want a better marriage? Want to have better friendships at school or at work? Don't worry about what they're doing, about your actions and your reactions to them. That's the focus. How are you going to act? How are you going to act differently? And the first two of these, verse 4, is love is patient and love is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is first patience. Now, patient is not quite mercy. It's nearly mercy, but there is a little bit of a distinction between mercy and Patience, and it's not merely just simply waiting nicely in a in, in a line or during a traffic jam. There's it, it's in the context of them doing something that provokes you. And some some of the older translations, rightly I think, put it describe this as long suffering. You suffer long, and a, a wrong. You've been you've been offended. You've done some people have done something that, that that's not okay, that's bad either to you or to something else, and you delay responding. Romans nine twenty two is a place where you can see what this this being described. It reads like this: If God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience. Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now notice how this word is used. God 
is rightly angry at sin. And there are people that, that, that at, even at this very moment, God's wrath remains on them. But he doesn't show it. He waits. He delays giving the consequences, the full consequences of sin. He's suffering their sin for a time. We know what they deserve, but they're not there. He waits. This is, this is the meaning of, of patience. It's to delay the, reward, the right reward for a wrong. The co- giving the consequence of it. It's a choice to delay, to wait. Active. This is not, patience is not a, is not a thing where you just kind of go, eh. No, you're actively choosing to not act when you're provoked. Waiting to see what will happen. And that's exactly what we are called to do. To wait. Wait for God to act. Wait for them to repent. And maybe also, on, from a human level, to see whether or not you're actually right. Because maybe you're wrong. See, God has been patient. Why, does God, why is God patient? Romans 2 tells us that God is patient because he wants people to repent. He's waiting for people to repent. It's also in 2 Peter 3, 9. Can we go to that one instead? Actually, you're right there. The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise for him to come and, and, and bring the final judgment. Why? But he is patient towards people, towards you, wishing that none should perish but repent. Why does he delay bringing the correct reward that they've earned, that we might have earned, because he wants people to come to repentance. His delay is actually a, a kind of, is a type of, it's love. I don't want to give that consequence to you. Can you please turn around on that? It brings, pa- it's patience. To bring repentance. This is why God is patient. This is why he's wanting to delay. And for us, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what we need to do. Is to be patient. To draw out our anger and to slow it down and not instantly respond when someone does something that that upsets you. Giving room for God's justice. Romans 12, 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves when someone has done something wrong to you. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. There will be justice. There will. But he needs to bring it, not you. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, you'll keep burning coals on their head. Let's not overcome evil. Let's not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, if we wait and we delay when someone's done something, it really gives you, there's three reasons. One, it gives them time to go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry. Right? How many times has that occurred? Yeah? Have you ever been in a fight with someone and you... For a miracle, in my case, I don't respond immediately. And the person, my wife, my son, someone, they, 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 they come a couple of, couple of hours later and go, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gotten upset. Woo, see, they repented. They realized they were wrong. And I didn't get a, need to get upset. They realized it all on their own. Second reason is sometimes... You get upset, and you realize, actually, I was wrong. They weren't. Have you ever had that happen? That happened to me a lot. I mean, a lot. I get upset about something. I'm all indignant, right? 
I'm having a conversation with Jesse, and, 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 and uh, I get all upset about something, and I respond, and then an hour later I go, ooh, I was wrong. Happens all the time to me. But if I were to delay my initial response of getting upset about something, but be patient, I would have realized, no, what they did was not wrong. I was wrong. It gives you a chance to realize that maybe what you're upset at isn't worth getting upset at. And that's a part of what Paul is saying in, in chapter 12. Is like, wait a minute, let God bring justice because you don't really always know what is just. Maybe you're wrong. And the third reason to sometimes delay is it'll give you a little bit more measured response. Because sometimes when, when someone does something that is rightly offensive, and if you immediately respond, it's not correct a right a type of response. Maybe it's a little over-the-top response. Give yourself a chance to step back and think about how should I respond to that moment. I did that yesterday where I did not respond in a measured mount. I should have waited, and I could have had a much better response. You need to wait and give a measured response. And often that response should be kindness, not justice. Because we are not told <laughs> to take vengeance ourselves but to be kind. What is kindness? Kindness, as described, in, and I love this dictionary, it's the 1829 Webster's Dictionary. Fantastic. You can find it online. It's a great dictionary. It puts today's dictionaries absolutely to shame. It defines goodness, uh, uh, kindness this way. It is that attitude or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others, done generously, cheerfully, not reluctantly or bitterly, gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants and needs, and alleviating their distress. What a definition. I'm going to read it again, because you really this is what this is what kindness is. It's not being nice. It can be that. That's, a, that's an expression, but just saying kindness is being nice just really rips the core out of, the, of what it really means to be a kind person, to have a kind response. It delight, it's the attitude or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others. Done generously, cheerfully, not reluctantly, or bitterly, Gratifying their wishes, supplying their wants and needs, or alleviating their distress. It's doing good to your enemies. It's doing good to those who don't deserve it. Not because you think they'll be repaid, they'll repay you. Not because you think they'll be grateful, it's doing it because you want to do it. That's kindness. Luke 6.35 is a place where Jesus is describing being kind, how his father is kind. But he says, but love your enemies, love those who are bad, those who are, want to hurt you, those who are not nice to you, but do good, lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the people who appreciate him, to the people who are, are who are righteous, no, to the ungrateful, to the evil. So you have to read these. All of these have to be read in the context of of your spouse, in your friend, your coworkers, not being nice to you. That's the moment to be kind. To do something that brings them happiness when they've been jerks to you. To be kind in that moment. To be lavish. To be abundant. 
and you're to be generous in doing good. Matthew 5, 44, 45 is a similar passage, but it adds one smite, slight twist that I want to show you. But Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of the Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain to the just, to the unjust. Irregardless of their deserving of it, God blesses people. I know we have this thing that, that, that says God only blesses people who are righteous. And he does bless people that are righteous. And maybe there's a way he blesses them more through Jesus, sure. But he does bless everybody. It's called common grace. He blesses everybody. Even those people who, who do not deserve it, appreciate it, or thank him. He delights in contributing to the, to the needs and the desires of people who hate him. This is what your father does all the time to the people who are mean, thoughtless, offensive, hurtful. And that's what we're called to be. To not respond immediately in anger when they do something that is rightly wrong. That's what God does. It's patience. Instead, be kind. Find ways to bless them. Do good to them. Even in the midst of them doing something wrong. Because that's what God does. Shockingly. In the very mo- have you thought about this? In the very moment of a man murdering another man, he still has the sun shining on him. In that moment, he could be eating an apple and enjoying the blessing of of enjoying God's goodness in that very moment while sinning. But that's your father. There will be justice, absolutely. But shockingly, your, your father still blesses them. And maybe that's what Paul is getting at a little bit when he says you'll, be, you'll heap burning coals on their head. Going back to that that Romans 12. Can you go back to that Romans 12? Don't avenge yourself, right? Leave room for God's wrath because there is justice coming. Instead, do what? Next verse. If you're hungry, they're hungry, feed him. If you're thirsty, give him something to eat. Drink. That's being kind. As you do, they will either repent because you're being patient Oh, you're going to bring more judgment on them because they haven't repented at your goodness. Because they should see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew 5. And if they don't, kindness is fierce. It's not a, it's not a nicey, nicey, pansy thing. No. There's, a, there's, a, there's almost an aggressiveness to it, a, a defiance. That even though in this very moment you're being mean to me, I am still going to do good to you. And it takes that kind of a mindset. And this, is, and this isn't all there is to say about, about love. We're going to have more to it. And it doesn't mean that you're a doormat. No, but it does mean that you still do good to them when they don't deserve it. Do you see why we're saying, no, none of this pointing, they need to hear this? Because even if your friend, your spouse is not being nice to you, the call is still for you to be good and loving and kind in the middle of it. And maybe they'll repent. And if not, God will deal with them. You don't need to. So, if I may use this phrase, bake the cake. And you know what I mean. It doesn't endorse the actions, but it's like your Father in heaven. 
Bake the cake. Bake the cake. Doesn't endorse the actions, whether you think it's right or wrong. You're like your father who still makes things shine on the people who are doing things that he doesn't like. Bake the cake. Okay? The choice to bring happiness, whether they deserve it or not, whether you agree with their actions or don't agree with their actions, you love everybody regardless because that's what your father does. And he will bring the justice, not you. That's kindness. So do you see that this is how God treats you? Do you think he gives you good things even though you don't deserve it? Do you see that he, he pours out blessing on blessing upon blessing? Or do you think that you deserve all of them? No. Do you think he's patient with you? And all of this culminates right here in the, in, in the gospel, guys. That before you came to Jesus, he was patient with you and not immediately sent you where you deserve, waiting for the repentance to come. And he blesses you far more than you think, because we sin far more than we think. Do you see your need? Do you see that you, you need to be more kind and more patient? I sure do. So repent. Repent by confessing to at least somebody. Best to the person you offended. And here's, here's a tip. Be specific. Really specific. As much detail as possible. None of this, hey, you know, I just wasn't rather nice to you the other day. No, no. What specifically did you not do? Own it. That's how you repent. Not in this generality stuff. No, 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 no. Specific. Be broken over your sin. Don't feel bad. Because that's the devil beating you up for it. Just change be resolved that i want to act differently and remember the gospel that your sins are forgiven that one day you will be what you long to be which is perfectly loving it'll happen one day all who have this hope of eternal life of being like jesus one day john first john 3 2 makes themselves more like him purifies himself. So show that. And have some practical steps on how to change. This is how God has loved you. 1 John 4. This is the love that God has made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God. Oh no, we have not loved God. But he loved you in the midst of your sin to do something good for you to be a propitiation for your sin, to remove God's wrath from you, that you might stand righteous and holy and forgiven before him. And beloved, if this is how God loved you, love each other. Let's come to the table. Pray with me. Father God, we are grateful that you treat us the way you do. We are utterly amazed at the greatness of your love for us. You, you're, you're, you are so much more lavish. You're so much more kind. You're so much more patient than I ever am. You're a good father. And you sent Jesus for us. And 
and we repent of our sin, we repent of our of our being quick to judge, quick to to respond in anger and in in and to bring the justice that frankly Jesus only you really can do perfectly. You still call us to call sin a sin. We'll get to that as we come down further. further. It does not rejoice in evil. Um, but for today, Jesus, help us to draw out our response to when people do things that are not nice to us and to respond with kindness. Thank you for the forgiveness that you give us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.